good to welcome everybody to the winning summit uh little conversation here uh, as people probably know by now the aims of the winning summit are to train how do we train champions off the court while we're training them on court and vice versa so specifically as very few of us will be making money out of tennis to train ourselves to survive and thrive in what's called the fourth industrial revolution and we're picking on various topics and today we're picking on leadership and i as ever i speak to mr david fish a lot humbled that one of the leaders of the private sector tennis is with me today to talk about leadership uh, so firstly david for those for those very few people that don't know who you are um can you just trace your background in tennis sure so i was a i was a quite a good junior tennis player privileged enough to attend harvard where i was hugely impacted by my, my coach who, who was one of the top coaches in the united states and i was fortunate enough to succeed him where i spent my next 44 years uh, as the head coach of men's tennis at harvard and along the way i got to be in leadership positions um, in USTA issues, in the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, the ITA issues, and generally had an opportunity to look at the game from a, a very wide lens, in addition to my microcosm of working with players on an individual basis, which was a great, um, a great challenge and opportunity and, and joy of my teaching uh, career. So I, so I feel that I had a chance to both be at the, at the center of working with players at, directly and building their leadership capacities, et cetera. But I also had a chance to look at the broad picture of what's, what's healthiest for tennis and how might we do it better. And that's always been a fascinating sidebar activity of mine. Did that lead directly into UTR? Tell us the UTR it story. It did. For probably the last 20 or 30 years, I watched the USTA struggle with how do we develop players? Should we be responsible for developing players? Historically, players had been developed in, in smaller regional or, or, or city-sized pockets, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Florida, et cetera. And then there was a, this, this uh, paradigm shift that said we as a national body should be developing players. And we watched them struggle over 20 years or so. Should players go to college? Should they not? And along the way, uh, I began to study systems around the world, uh, including the French system. And the French, French system, and this was not my idea, this was the credit to Dave Howell, the originator of something called UTR, Universal Tennis Rating. But Dave observed that the players in France, they would generate decade after decade of world-class players, but they would also generate huge enthusiasm for the base of the players, that it was not a winner take all approach. It was something that was inviting for everybody. And I began to look and say, how could we operationalize these concepts outside of one country uh, and, and begin to reorganize say tennis in the United States or South America, et cetera. How might we integrate players of different age groups the way they used to organically integrate and play with each other and, and largely we, what, what I observed was that when the WTA and the ATP and the ITF began to control what we call open tennis, that a lot of those opportunities to play locally and affordably all began to dry up around the world. And so that became my interest in how could we have a universal rating system that would allow us to quantify the level of play for everybody so that we might begin to integrate genders and, and, um, and ages in a way that historically used to be the most productive way for players to grow up. You had 16 year old players playing with 22 and 35 year old and 40 year old people. They would get educated. They would make more decisions. They would see more diversity. And it was a much richer experience and a much, more, a, a much better uh, mentorship experience. They learned about sportsmanship and tradition, et cetera. So that was exciting to me. And that's how I got involved with UTR nine years ago in, in writing so, the original white paper for that. So as you were director of development for UTR for about a decade, 
Yes. Uh, well, no, actually, it 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 shifted through. We, uh, one of my former uh, captains on our team, Mark Leslie, came in and and took over the majority um, ownership of UTR, and uh, and I was the head of development for about two years, doing that. And um, and and it's been a fabulous growth in terms of the opportunity uh, um, uh, around the world for people to have what we would call level-based play. Which is and you must game. have, sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. You must have met then many leaders in tennis in different guises and shapes all around the world. How lucky is that? Extremely lucky. And I'm, <laughs> I'm ever so grateful for including meeting people like you. So oh. you can pay me. So money. I'm going to sort of put you on the spot. So it's just my hypothesis, this. And, and, and I'm going to do a pregnant pause for others watching, listening this to come to their own uh, answer. <clears throat> but I would propose there is one of all the characteristics of great leaders. There is one single characteristic that separates great leaders from not so great leaders. And my pregnant pause is now so people can think, well, what is that characteristic? And there are many great characteristics of leaders, but I would argue that the ability to see the battlefield in all its diversity and clarity is the single biggest characteristic of a successful leader. Because if you've got bits missing or lots missing, you're firing blind and making mistakes. But the ability to see the entire battlefield uh, is crucial and, and it doesn't really matter whether what level of leadership you are as a player or a coach or a director of tennis or whatever, you see your portion of the battlefield. So I'm not asking you to agree or disagree, but where you are now with the, and it's a wrong analogy, I think, the battlefield of tennis in COVID and post-COVID, how do you see the land? Well, I think it's a wonderful, it, it, as much as we uh, say, uh, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, this has been a, a crisis in the way that it has allowed us to step back and look at how we've done things over the last 40 or 50 years and say, when we reboot this system, and there will be a reboot, do we go back to the same old, same old? that has caused tennis and we've watched tennis be in a consistent decline it's been a bearish market and at this point we have to sharpen our tools in order to make good investments in a bearish market you have to really understand value and so as we're looking for how do we produce value for tennis in the 21st century i think covid has revealed it's kind of opened up a a, a, a a split, we can look back to the past and say, what actually worked so well in the past and how have we somehow forgotten that? And not pretend that we can go back to the past because we can't, we can't go back to an older, simpler time in Pollyanna language, but we can take advantage of many of those tools that were community-based. That's where tennis's real growth happened. The tennis boom happened because of TV and good players, but it happened in locations all over the world uh, and it was not administratively driven it was not federation driven and we have to have the sort of the the humility to recognize that that the federations were the beneficiaries of this rising tide and that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the that that their decision should be the only way we look at how do we move tennis forward into the 21st century and as you've tried to say is let's have public and private partnerships work together so you take the best ideas out there and begin to feed them a little bit and see how well they work and so that's what my efforts have been now and will continue to be is how can we make tennis uh, more accessible for people more affordable and how can we put the, the the real joy back into the experience so that we go from the it, we i think we've gone from the game of tennis to the business of tennis yeah and it's kind of engineered a lot of the fun out of it. Yeah. And do you know, um, do you have a view how to uh, put the delicious back into tennis? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think the clues are all all around us, Mark. I think there there are these what we call in in um, um, in agriculture heirloom products. There are apple trees that are more delicious than other apple trees. There are certain kinds of events like the Ojai event in California, which has been running for 120 years, almost uh, uh, unbroken except for COVID. There are these heirloom events that give us clues to the kind of community and the kind of fun and all-inclusive nature that tennis used to have. We, I used to play in age groups where I would see the 12 and unders and 14 and unders, 16 and under, 18 and under, we would be playing regularly with older, smarter adults. And we've largely stratified the game so much that we've kind of engineered that flavor out of the game. And now is our opportunity to bring that, put that flavor back into yeah. it um, uh, by, by examining the clues that history has left us. Yeah. And if we then apply that deep historical knowledge of where we've been and put them together 21st century tools, we can make this affordable for millions more people and, and continue and to have it be uh, not just a chance to be good, good competitors like France does, but actually have the majority of people also really love being at the banquet of an event, of a community-wide event. And that puts the flavor back into it, in my opinion. Beautiful. So you, you are an acknowledged record. Oh, you've... You've been awarded something prestigious recently. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's, it's all, a, all, which of the many prestigious things have I been awarded? You no, know, it, it was a lovely honor from the USTA and the, and the International Tennis Hall of Fame, the Tennis and Education Award. And, um, and, and I was um, humbled to be uh, acknowledged along with all the people who've won it before. Uh, but I believe that we're, we're at a place where we know that tennis can use help. We've got people that are all interested in moving it in the same direction. Tennis in general has, has, a, has a challenge. We, we, we tend, to, we tend to, to migrate toward entropy. We just kind of go off and each try to control our own little fiefdoms. Um, but in general, uh, the highest form of competition is cooperation. And wow. cooperation, that's how the Swedes did so well when they dominated tennis in the world. Um, that's how people like, that's how work groups like Boletaries, like Port Washington Tennis Academy under Harry Hopman. Um, historically, these have been the very highly generative, productive systems out of which players came. And as a friend of ours, Mike Barrell, really an expert in the, in the entry level experience for tennis players worldwide said, the tallest trees are always found in the jungle. That's, that's where people grow. Competition just pushes people to do it better. You don't find them in a hothouse. Wow. I've never heard that quote before. It's a lovely Very wise, quote. Mr. Mike very, Barrow. Very wise. And, uh, and he's one of the more insightful people into what, how we've taken the delicious out of competition and the experience and why so many kids are opting to go in a different direction. And we Great. have tools in that. Great. So without any false humbleness, you are an acknowledged international leader in the private sector of tennis. And we are honored for you to train, speak about leadership at the Winning Summit. But in common with all the other speakers, this is going to be something tangible that people can take away and train. So my words, not David's, because David's will have his own words on the summit. But there could be three skills that unpack this single characteristic of seeing the battlefield. And one would be intuition, because all the big breakthroughs are intuitive. They're not mathematical and logical. They are intuitive. So how do you train your intuitive? And again, I would argue that having deep expertise of a subject matter and once you program your subconscious to go and find the problem the problem will be intuitive without that deep level of expertise which you have in all forms of tennis it, it just comes out as a wish or a dream or a hunch and the third thing i would say is that you need to be distanced from the core because if you're deep into it 
let's say the federations, you can't see the problem because you are in it. I was going to say part of the problem, but that's not true. You're, you're so deep in, you can't see the wood for the trees. So those are my takes. Those are three skills, which we will talk about in intuition later on and how you can train it on the tennis court for you to be intuitive off the court. And David will have his own presentation. So, Mr. David Fish, thank you very much, as ever, of being on the interview, devoting your time and leadership skills to the summit, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Mark. I look forward to hearing all the other great speakers there, too. Thank you. We have some amazing speakers. We've got 37 yes. other amazing speakers, it's Mr. Remarkable. Fish. It's a buffet. Thank you very much. Great.